every kid who has ever seen a science fiction movie. Great Garlu! With these battery-operated controls, you can make Garlu go. Own the most fantastic toy of all. Great Garlu by Marx. <laughs> Welcome to RBC Disruptors. I'm John Stackhouse, and it's my privilege to host our monthly conversation about innovation and uh, disruption and how technology is changing everything around us. If you're joining us on Facebook Live or WebEx, welcome. Please join the conversation. A special shout out to our friends from uh, McMaster University and York University watching us live. Uh, we will welcome your questions as we go. We've got a friend here on stage who's talking. <laughs> if you haven't noticed, it's a special season. It's a season of many things, but a season of toys. So we thought this month, let's talk about disruption and toys and games. It's a $200 billion industry. And we're so lucky to be joined today by one of the great innovators in the sector, a Canadian and a Canadian company, Spin Master. Uh, we're joined by its founder, Ronan Harari. Ronan, welcome to RBC Disruptors. John, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, round of applause for Ronan. And uh, John, John's a little upset with me because I disrupted the presentation with the moving egg over here. This is just the beginning. We are going to break many <laughs> models uh, today. So roll with us. This is meant to be a lot of fun. We're trying to do things, uh, we're trying to do things uh, a little bit differently or a lot differently. If you don't know Spin Master, it is now the world's fourth largest toy company. Started here uh, in Toronto. It's got roughly the same market cap now as Mattel, which is amazing. So well, congratulations. It's US Canadian dollars. Whatever. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> they don't know what's about to uh, take them. And if you don't know Ronan, he's a uh, a uh, good Toronto guy, went to uh, University of Western Ontario, right. uh, and out of there, right out of there started uh, Spin Master. We're going to hear a lot more about uh, how, he, uh, how he did that. He's also uh, an avid surfer and an incredible photographer. We're going to see a bit more of that later, uh, the photography that is, unless, okay. you, unless you brought your surfboard and a, a toy to play with it. Can't do that. Um, let's start with some quick snappers, uh, Ronan, about uh, you and toys. Sure. Favorite toy as a kid? Favorite toy was uh, the Spider-Man um, wing uh, web uh, maker. That's good. The thing you put in your hand and, and off it went. <laughs> Best toy of all time. That we made or in the? And, and in the universe. That's a, that's a good question. Um, Best toy of all time. Lego. Lego, yeah. Lego, we got an audience. Lego, yeah. Lego, thank Legos. you. Lego is one of the, it, it is one of the greatest toys and one of the greatest brands of all time. Um, if you had to take one toy to a desert island, you know, I would take a tennis ball. Tennis ball. Yeah, just okay, to keep yeah, it yeah, busy. Yeah, a tennis player. Okay, and uh, Hatchimals. Before Hatch we get going, sure. Tell us a bit about these. You know, well, does everybody know Hatchimals? Yeah. yeah. You know, these are uh, these are living creatures that are in these eggs, and this is the one from this year, which is the the uh, the baby. And the baby rocks back and forth. So we thought we'd, what would be really cool is if we can have three of you guys hatch these for us today. Um, I've been told you guys in the front audience. <laughs> so the, basically the way it works is you need to love these to life. So the more you touch them, the more you corral them, okay, they'll start to actually come alive and they'll start to hatch. So when they start hatching, bring them back up and so we can show everybody else. But you need to love them. And so like rub them and, you know. Thank you. You're welcome. And... This is the twins. This is from last year. Is there anyone here from HR? Are, 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 are we okay here? Okay, good. And then these, these are the originals. This is what I call the pecker. This is, <laughs> this is a totally different mechanism. But you'll understand when you, when, you, when you see what happens. So I'll give these to you guys here. So if you hear that nattering, that's the, the Hatchimals. It's not, uh, it's not our audience. Okay, we'll come back to you. Thanks for, uh, thanks for playing along with us. 
Um, Ronan, I wonder if you can start by setting uh, a bit of level setting about the toy industry. Sure. How big is it? Uh, in the U.S., it's about a $20 billion market. Canada is about $2 billion, and internationally, it's about equivalent to the same size. Growing, shrinking, but, flat? Uh, growing about 3 4% a year. That's pretty good. Yep. That's pretty good. And growing mostly in, in, the, uh, in Asia. So what, what, what are the best markets these days for, what is the best market for toys right now? Well, the, the best market in the world is still the United States. On average, a parent buys about $350 per kid. Same here in Canada. And then uh, the $350 UK. per year? Per year per kid. Per kid. Yeah. Per kid. Um, and then uh, UK, France, they're all really good markets. And then you have the emerging markets like Russia, Poland, Eastern Europe is doing really well. That's amazing. We'll, yeah. get, uh, we'll, 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 we'll get to that. Let's go back to the beginning of uh, Spin Master. It's a well-told story about how you and uh, your childhood friend Anton uh, came out of university and you decided to start your own business. Um, Earth Buddy, we got uh, an Earth Buddy here. Yes, that's a, that's a good replica. <laughs> <laughs> what about uh, that caught your eye? And, and for you and Anton, was there like a Woody and Buzz? Sorry? Was there a Woody and Buzz kind of, uh, remember Toy Story moment where you thought, yeah, toys are going to be the future. We've got to be there. No, you know, it's actually when we started with the, the Earth Buddy, um, it was actually sold to horticulture. So when we were making Earth Buddy, we never even, the, the idea of toys actually didn't even come into our, into our mindset. So basically we saw the Earth Buddy, it was, um, it's made out of grass seeds, nylon, sawdust, and it was a product that was selling in Israel. My family's from Israel. My mom was reading the newspaper. And there was a two-page spread of all these six different manufacturers there that were making the product. And in classic Israeli style, they were saying how well they were doing. And, and so we read it and we were like, well, no one's making it here in Canada. And maybe we should actually make and sell it. So a few weeks later, my grandmother came. And she brought me and my sisters one for, uh, for presents. And then uh, I drove up to Western. Anton was still in business school. And I'm like, why don't we make a bunch of these? And he's like, you know, I'm interviewing a P&G. And I'm not exactly sure. And, Meanwhile, he didn't get into P&G. Um, neither did my other partner, Ben. He interviewed at Leo Burnett. He never got into Leo Burnett. Um, but anyway, so basically, we looked at him. We said, well, why don't we just like, make 5,000 pieces for Mother's Day and see how they go? And so that's what we did. Um, we figured out how to manufacture the product. We got my brother-in-law, who's an engineer. And he came, and he figured out how to manufacture it. And my sister, she designed the packaging. And we gave them profit sharing on whatever the, whatever the sales would be. Um, and so we made 5,000 pieces for Mother's Day, and we put it out in the marketplace, and we started selling it in the streets of Toronto. Um, and then we came back into the little warehouse that we had, and we still had like 4,500 pieces left. <laughs> <laughs> and then we, went to, then we went to some distributors, and I ended up going to this place called Samco Sales, first distributor I went to, and they sell closeout toys. You're having fun there, I can tell. <laughs> and so they, they sell closeout toys, and, and it was... He's like, yeah, we'll take the product, you know, no problem. And then we get a call two weeks later, and they're like, uh, we need an order for 26,000 pieces um, for Walmart Canada. And so then we produced more product, um, and then we ended up getting an order for half a million pieces from Kmart, um, which I shared with you the story. Yeah, so tell, tell the story of, uh, of, of Kmart, because this is so th the reality so of retail. It's brutal. Yeah, this was Kmart back in the day. This is like 1994. And so we're up and running, and we have, we have two factories. We're actually producing right at uh, Queen and Spadina. Um, and, uh, and then somehow Anton had a connection through a guy that he met backpacking in Europe who had some relationships with Kmart. And he's like, I can get you an appointment with Kmart. And for some reason, I was the one that actually drove down and actually did the appointment. Went down there and did a whole presentation to the buyer. And after 30 minutes, he says to me, he says, you know, I'm not the buyer for the product. It's the one that's pecking, you can actually just put it down. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's perfect, because they're all ready to go. Too, too much love. Um, <laughs> so, so I went and I do this full presentation to the buyer, and after 30 minutes he looks at me and he says, you know, I'm not the buyer for this product, and I'm like, nah, he must be telling me a story. So I pitch him again for another 15 minutes, and he says, you know, I'm, I'm really not the buyer. So I'm like, okay, well, we'll give you the product on consignment sales, no problem, when you sell it, you pay us, it's all be fine. He's like, I don't think you really understand. I'm not the buyer. And I said, well, can you do me a favor? I drove four hours. Can you let me know who the buyer is? So he goes to his office. He comes back. He gives me the buyer's name on a piece of paper. I shook his hand. said, thank you very much. And then I proceed to walk around Kmart Corporation looking for this buyer. <laughs> and luckily, okay, she was sitting at her desk. And I 
did a 30 second pitch and she's like, okay, well, I'll see you at three o'clock. So I said, great, went downstairs, never left the lobby and never went for lunch, just sat there. She called me up at three o'clock, went up and as I walk into her office, she's got seven competitor products, okay, on the left side. And I'm like, wow. And I was going in with the price of 265 and then I saw the competitor product. I'm like, okay, we're going in at a buck 65 to get this sale. <laughs> Dropped straight away. Um, and she was an amazing woman. And I did the pitch and she was like, she said to me, okay, well, we're going to order 48,000 pieces. And if the 48,000 pieces go well, then we're going to give you an order for half a million. And that's what happened. So we ended up producing the half a million pieces for Kmart. Um, we got the order in basically July and we started shipping her in like September. And by the end of the year, we had sold about a million pieces. And she was a phenomenal, phenomenal lady. And I think the, the only reason why we got the order was she loved young entrepreneurs. That was her thing. She called me a year later. She said, can you come down to Detroit? I want you to speak to some inner city kids. And obviously I went and, and gave a chat, but she like loved helping young people. That's fantastic. Yeah. And then your next big toy was air hogs. And I think we've got a demonstration here. Of, uh, the... So who knows air hogs? <laughs> I told you we were gonna do some surfing. That's, that's awesome. So this is the, so, new, the, the, the new air hog. <laughs> this, HR, please turn your back on, on, the, on this so, stuff. So, so how does, tell us a bit about how the business works with sure. inventors, because that came, the original air hog right. came from what, it was a British guy, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, John Dixon, Peter yeah. Manning. So how does so, that work? How does he find you or you find him? Yeah, so it's a great question. So in, in the toy industry, it's, it's predominantly driven by about 200 inventors from around the world and they constantly come up with ideas, but they never commercialize them. And what they will do is they'll take those ideas to toy companies like a Mattel or Hasbro or Spin Master, and we'll license those products from them in perpetuity, and we'll give them an advance against a guarantee, and they usually get about a 5% royalty on the wholesale selling price of the toys. And so after the Earth Buddies, we came up with a product called Devil Sticks, which was a three-piece juggling set for kids. We ended up selling it to Toys R Us. We ended up selling it to KB Toys. And then from there, um, the buyers were like, well, what else do you have to, to show us? And um, then we started to learn about these, this inventor network. Right. And um, it's actually quite amazing because uh, uh, one of Jen Irwin's, I don't know if you guys remember the Irwin family. So my business partner, Ben, lived with Jen Irwin and they were really kind to us. And they said, you know, you guys are getting into the toy business and there's all these toy inventors out there. And they gave us the list. Wow. Okay, so my business partner, Ben, went around excuse me, he went around and he actually started calling all these inventors. And we took our Earth Buddies and we took our Devil Sticks and we thought we were really proud of the, what we had accomplished at that point in time. And basically what happened was they, they would dust off everything that was in the closets. And basically everything they couldn't sell to Mattel or Hasbro, <laughs> they basically showed to us. And so we saw this product in 1996, which was the Air Hogs, which was an airplane that, that had a little one-cylinder pneumatic engine attached to a PT bottle. You pumped it up, flicked the propeller, and it flew around for 45 seconds. And for some of you guys that are my age, you remember when growing up, you had the balls of wood planes or you had the gas power planes. You, you basically got one flight from the gas power plane and, or it took off your finger. It was like one or the other. <laughs> and and, and uh, so we were like, wow, this thing is unbelievable. And so we licensed it from those guys and we spent the next two years learning how to design, develop, engineer. We worked with two companies in, in uh, the United States. Um, I used to go every two weeks to, to get it developed, and then eventually we took it to China, we found a factory, got it manufactured, and we brought it back in, in, um, in uh, 1998, and, uh, and then it went on to become a, a global success. Right, so you know, it's a great bit of background on that. If I can jump forward another decade to your next big, big hit, which is back again, which is here. So you guys, you guys, I... I... <laughs> <laughs> You already hatched them. What happened? I, I tell you, there's a lot of love at RBC. Yeah. I'll tell you, this is a this is a loving bank. Yeah. You guys, you guys maybe need to change the slogan. Yeah. The slogan. We have we have that on film. We may yes. uh, try try to send that send that out. So, back again. This changes the company because you start to s take a different approach rather than just uh, licensing toys and uh, working between the inventor Correct. and the retailer. Correct. Now you see it as a multimedia platform. Give us a sense yeah. of how that thinking came about, particularly working with yep. the Japanese, because that's like the Silicon Valley of toys. Right? Yeah, I mean, they're super creative in Japan. I mean, it's probably between the United States and Japan, it's the most creative place in the world for, for toys. 
And so we started going over to Japan in the year 2000 um, to see if we can actually partner with people over there and see if we can get the rights to take the product and sell them in, in North America. And so I personally started going there and I would do trip after trip after trip and dinner after dinner after dinner and drinking after drinking after drinking. We did it for a lot of years. Um, but one thing we were able to do is we were able to learn how the Japanese actually um, create content and how they actually design and develop toys. And so Japan is really famous for things like Pokemon. It's really famous for Beyblade. It's really famous for Transformers, all those really magical toy slash TV shows. And so we always dreamed about potentially doing something like that when we had the opportunity. And so Bakugan was originally um, this idea that came from a 23-year-old inventor. And he had the idea to actually take an action figure and put it into a marble. And he, put a, he had a few drawings on a piece of paper. And he had a rep who was named Shelley Goldberg, who was a guy who was in his 50s. And he was repping people. It's an amazing story. First time inventor. Okay, and a guy that was repping him and never really had you know, much success in his life. So he shows, he shows or success selling toys. So he shows this, this product to uh, uh, the Bens, my partner Ben and Ben Dermer who do inventor relations. And they take it in and they're like, this is fantastic, an action figure and a marble, wonderful. So we sign it, we build the prototype and our prototype was the best we could do was this, basically that you manually opened it up and there was the action figure and you had to peel the action figure out. So we looked at it and we said, well, you know, we have these relationships with these Japanese companies. They love small. They love, you know, innovative stuff. Maybe they'll partner with us. So we went to Japan and we pitched um, Bandai. We pitched, uh, it was Bandai. We pitched Tomy, okay, and we pitched a company called Sega Toys. Bandai, Bandai turned us down. Tomy turned us down. And there was a smaller toy company called Sega which is run by this amazing guy who's just like a toy genius. His name is Mr. Kokoban. And he looked at and he said, first of all, he doesn't speak any English, but he said, I like that a lot. But he's okay. like the Steve Jobs of uh, Kinda. toys. Yeah. So he, he said, I, I love it. We'll, we'll partner with you guys on it. I come back two months later. What did he love about it? What did he see? You know, because he doesn't speak English, I don't really know. But... <laughs> <laughs> but in the toy, but the, but in the toy industry, you're like, it was, it's the wish fulfillment. It's like he saw the wish fulfillment of something, some character hidden inside a ball. That's, that's what he saw, wish right? For, it's the wish fulfillment, yeah. right? The, the unknown, the unexpected, and the fact that you can have multiples and you can collect them, which is really important in, in our industry. Um, and he had this amazing vision where he, where he, he put inside this pop-open mechanism where you can actually roll the Bakugan onto a card, have a magnet inside, and then when it hits the card, it can pop open and transform, and then you can actually close it and you can repeat the play multiple times. And then they put this gameplay into it where they put point scores into the Bakugan and they put points on the, on the bottom of the cards. And so when I went back two or three months later, I was like, wow, this is incredible. And then at that point in time, I turned to him and I said, well, what do you guys think about doing a television show? You know, we'll do like an animation like Pokemon, 52 episodes, something like that. And he turned to me and he said, well, it's going to cost 12 million bucks. Do you have six? And I said to him, I need a few months. <laughs> yeah, let me get back to you. And, uh, and so we came back home and spoke to the partners. And we ended up putting in a quarter of the money. And we ended up getting Chorus here in Canada um, to come into for, for a quarter. Because we wanted to at least have one broadcaster. <laughs> we wanted to assure ourselves at least one place that it would play. Um, so that's what happens. We put in the six million bucks and we partnered together. We created the first season. We ended up selling it to Cartoon Network globally around the world through the United States. Um, and then it went on to become this, this global franchise, which ran for four years and became a billion dollar franchise. But you almost took it too far. Maybe you did take it too far because the company ran into some challenges. What, uh, what happened? Uh, okay. We're really progressing through the story here, John. <laughs> I'll tell you. We, uh, I'm, wor I'm worried about the Hatchimals. I mean, I want to get to them. Um, yeah, so I mean, our company, we, we ran the company f for 16 years, um, and we always had growth on the top line, and we always had growth on the bottom line. And I had never seen a bracket before, OK? Um, and, uh, and then in year 17 to 18, we basically we saw brackets, and then I got a rash. Um, and, and, uh, what do you mean by brackets? Brackets. Yeah. The bankers all here. Yeah. <laughs> losses, losses, losses. Uh, no, but we had this incredible 
we had this incredible run where we basically, you know, went from uh, standing starts up to about $900 million in sales. And at the time, in our 16th year, we hit $900 million in sales, and Bakugan represented about 44% of the company's sales. And when you're younger and you're growing a business, everybody gets excited, and you, you expand, and we expanded internationally, and we opened up offices, and we started to hire, and, and, and we basically grew the company. We basically grew the company too fast, um, and there wasn't a solid enough diversified portfolio of products underneath to sustain the growth. And so in year 17 and 18, we had to restructure the company. Um, we did four restructurings in 24 months. Uh, unfortunately, we had to let go of 350 people, 35% of our workforce. And so it was a very difficult time for us where we had to restructure the company, but at the same time, grow the company and invest in content and invest in new products and um, make some acquisitions. And so we had to do everything at the same time to, to uh, preserve the company and preserve everything that we had built in those in those 16 years. But having, I guess one of the lessons out of that is having that diversified portfolio. You're probably like a movie studio. You just, you don't know what's gonna be the hit, but you've gotta have a, a, a cycle of them to ensure that uh, when the hit comes, yeah. you can expand it, but then you've got the next hit coming, that's a, coming along. That's exactly right. Like, so we built out the games part of our business, which is the, you know, it's, it's, it's the non-exciting part of the business, but it's very constant. There's reoccurring revenue to it. You don't have to like come out with a hit every single year. Um, you know, we bought a company called uh, Meccano, which is based in construction. Not as good as Lego, but it's, it is, uh, it's decent. Um, and, uh, you know, so we diversified, we, we did a lot of things to diversify the company and make the company much more sustainable. And we, and we actually came out of the process um, a much stronger company. And, and you're focusing a lot more now on innovation. I mean, I was in your office last week. It's amazing. Just all the, the, oh, the buzz around there, open concept, uh, lots of fun. Obviously, it's a toy company, um, but you can really feel the creativity in, in, in the air. And on your wall, you've got the word spinovation. Right. What does that mean? What's spinovation? It's, uh, it's a strange word. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's, just, it's, it's all about being open to ideas from wherever they come from. Um, it's about infusing innovation. It's, it's all about not being derivative with the products that we put out in, into the world um, and that we're working on. Um, it's, it's all about just infusing freshness and newness into our products. And how, how do you ensure that you've got that going in your culture, in, the, in that office? You know, I mean, first we, we set, we, we have one mantra, which is we're open to ideas from wherever they come from. Um, and that could be externally from around the world, that could be internally from um, our own inventors, I mean, our own internal design people, um, and, uh, and then just that constant desire to actually um, infuse magic into the products. And, and the greatest thing about the toy industry is that, you know, kids are so honest, they're just brutally honest, and they want, they want new and exciting all the time. And so that pushes us constantly to do different things. Um, and, uh, and then also as a result of you know, because we started in the business, and the business was, actually when we started, it was a consolidated business. There was two big players, there was Mattel and Hasbro. And so to be able to break through into the marketplace, um, you had to break through with fresh and new mm -hmm. and innovative stuff. And so that's very deeply seated into the DNA of, of, of who we are as a company. So your, your, your toys, I think you said, they, they, they've got to be magical, they've got to be kind of first of a kind and one of a kind, at least to that kid and right. maybe the parents who are making the decision. Hatchimals. Yes. Of, Meets, meets that test. Maybe we can uh, turn to uh, our yes, friends let's, here let's, who have hatched. We'll, and, we'll start and in, we'll tell, st explain to us what's been happening while we've been talking. Well, first of all, thank you very much. No, you're welcome. That's awesome. So this is, this is the first Hatchimal, okay? And so, you know, when John came to the office, he said, you know, you talk about disrupting. So this is, first of all, I'm gonna put it down. So the way it works actually is if you, if you put it down, it should actually stop pecking. Let's see if it works. Did it? Yeah. And then okay. if you started holding it again and giving it love, then it starts to uh, what do you What do you think of the product? It's, it's, it's definitely different. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I actually second guessed myself because I thought I was like, you know, like a really nice, loving person. Okay. <laughs> No, it takes a while. It takes a while. You know, we actually had to play with the speed a little bit. Some, some kids wanted to, to love longer and some wanted to love faster, right? So we can actually change that in the programming, right? But now, it's, so the way it's actually done now is like you put it down. If you don't love it, it stops, it stops the pecking. 
So I actually had one in my office where I, like, I half birthed it and I left it for two months. And I just let it sit there. And John's like, why are you telling me that? <laughs> but anyways, um, so the thing about disrupt, I was talking about before about disruption is that stuff like this, this disrupts the industry, okay? Because never before could you have a fully functioning character inside an egg. The material is fully patented um, that you can actually peck through. It moves 360 degrees inside. Um, it's interactive. And so like five years ago, um, this probably would have been like $250, which is completely price prohibitive for, for a birthday present or, for, or a holiday present. Um, but what our team was able to do is they were able to marry um, the, the programming with the, the mechanism together, and that's what we call like, the firmware. That's the middle piece that sits that manages both parts. Um, and so it's incredible programming that's actually in here and low component prices that really disrupt the industry to bring something that you've actually never seen before at a price point that, that everybody can, can afford. And, and one big thing about our industry, it's, it's, it's disrupted by price points. The moment you can hit those magical price points, okay, the biggest price point where you do the most amount of volume is $9.99, then it goes to $19.29. This was actually exceptional, it was at $59.99. Most people thought you can actually, wouldn't be able to sell the product at that price point. Um, but everything sub 100 with amazing technology completely disrupts. Gives you an opportunity. Can you give us some insight into how you uh, worked with the technology, how you developed that uh, idea? How, I guess how, how, how you innovated this? Sure, so the, this one here actually came from, it was an internal product. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so, John, why don't you open it while I, while I talk? I'm not, I can't do two things. You just pull it right off the top. It doesn't, it doesn't like me. Here, let me try. <laughs> There you go. Thanks. That's my Christmas present to you, John. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so this was actually an internal product that came from, we have a team called ACT in the office, Advanced Concepts and Technology, and they work outside of the day-to-day the -day stuff and they're just coming up with ideas. And so they came up with the idea of a character popping out of an egg, and then we worked on the technology, and then we actually co-developed it with an inventor group out of San Francisco, um, which is really well known for uh, programming and mechanisms, and we did uh, uh, an advance against, and we gave some royalties on it. Um, and so it was a real collaboration between the outside group and Spin Master internally. How do you ensure that that, I mean, you said there's what, 100 inventors in the US, maybe 150 in Japan, so a very small community, yep. small, tight ecosystem. How do you ensure they come to you rather than go to Mattel or Hasbro or someone else? You know, I think success begets success. So once you work with an inventor and you develop the relationship and you get one of their products out to market um, and they start earning money and royalties, then you've developed a really intimate relationship and then um, they're more inclined to, to continue to working with you. Um, but then we do other things like, for example, every year we do an inventor trip and we take 15 inventors around the world and Ben leads the trip and he's taken them everywhere from South Africa, they've gone to, to Vegas, they've gone to Iceland, they've gone to Israel. Um, so it's really at the end of the day, it's the personal relationships. And then we also do other things like, for example, you know, when an inventor creates a product, they feel very attached to it. Um, and they don't want to just sell it to you and then just see it on the shelf 24 months later. They really want to be involved in the process and they want to have their, you know, their fingerprints on it and, and they want to see their, they want to be part of the finished product. They don't want to see it turn into something completely different. So we're fine with inventors coming in and working in our offices and working with the staff and the design people and, and being fully integrated in, in whatever way that they feel, feel comfortable. Then we also do other things that, that was revolutionary at the time was like whenever we won an award at the, the, at the Toadies, which is like our Oscars, you know, we would invite the inventors up, right? So the inventors were always like hidden, they weren't really talked about, you know, um, and the toy companies would take all the, all the, 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 the accolades. Um, so we'd invite them up and they, they would we'd get them to speak and, and talk about where the invention came from. So a lot of, a lot of that type of stuff. You know, we're, we're about, we love working with creative people and we'll integrate them any which way we possibly can at the end of the day to get the best results um, for the finished product and for the kids. At the and end. when so you're working with the inventors, I'm looking at the, the motorcycle, maybe we can uh, demonstrate that as well and catch it a bit on camera because this is going to be on the market next year. Yeah, you guys maybe want, explain a bit about what makes want, this magical. Do you want to bring this up on stage? So 
So this is, this is something we've been working on for about three years. Um, and it fully writes itself. It, it doesn't turn over. Um, it can do 360s on the spot. It can do wheelies. <laughs> oh. It, nice. Beautiful. Thank you very much. All right, thanks. So when, when you're developing these, whether it's the motorcycle or Hatchimals or something else, and working with these crazy inventors, there was that guy from Wisconsin last week. Yep. It was, was fascinating. In yep. your office, he had a suitcase yep. uh, demonstrating the new, uh, the, the, the new dog he was developing. Do you talk to them about you know, what kids like or how to, uh, you know, w whether these are good for kids or not or what parents are going to like or what works mechanically? What, what yeah. drives the conversation? I think, I think all of it does. You know, what's good for kids, what, a lot of stuff in the toy industry is, is being, um, is knowing what's come before you, right, and knowing the histories of toys, because you're always trying to do something new and non-derivative, so you really need to understand what happened before and what's, what's the play pattern. Um, you know, in our industry, it's, it's all about, um, it's about the play patterns and the magic, and are you bringing a play pattern that's um, rooted in success, has it had success in the past, and potentially, if you use that work with that play pattern, you will potentially have success again, but mirroring that play pattern with something that's new and fresh at the same time. But it's, uh, there's, there's lots of really exciting discussions. But uh, the inventors are funny, they're, they're, they're really, in a way they're kind of like kids too. So you're asking the point before about like, you know, why do they work with us versus other people? Well, you just want that constant relationship because once they invent something, okay, it's kind of like when you're getting married and you have that wedding ring, you know, you just can't, it's like burning a hole in your pocket. It's the same thing with the vendors. They, once they invent something, they just want to show it. So you constantly just need to be there with them all the time. And then a lot of times we give inventors ideas that, that we're thinking about, and then they come back with different executions on it. So it's very much an iterative process going back right. and forth. So, so that's a good lead into the Paw Patrol story. Okay. Is there anyone here who doesn't know Paw Patrol? <laughs> it's like this gigantic force in, uh, in kids' ent entertainment. It's like a multi-billion dollar franchise now, I believe. Yep. Take us back to, what was it, 2013, 2012 when this? Yes, uh, 2012, 2013. Um, so we were just coming off the heels of Bakugan, and Bakugan sells to kids that are usually like five to nine, and it's all about this magical transformation. So we said, well, what about if we can do magical transformation for preschoolers? And that was our thesis. So we took that thesis, married that with the fact that we had opened up a production office here in Toronto, um, and we started to produce our own television shows. And so we created this brief, and we said we wanted to do transformation for preschoolers, um, and we sent it out to five different creative people around the world, and we had various different takes that came back, and the best one that we liked came back from Keith Chapman, which is the original creator of Bob the Builder. Yeah. Um, and he came up with the whole conceit of these dogs that go on these rescue missions, and they all have a different character trait to them. And then we were like, well, that's great, and we can do transforming backpacks, and we can make the dog houses transform. Um, and we just started this journey and we found amazing writers and we found an amazing director and voice talent and an amazing animation studio here in Toronto and, and it, just, it just came together. It was one of those things that you know, no one expected that it would be as prolific and so and resonate with kids the way it has around the world. Um, everybody was just putting a lot of love into it and just focusing on everybody focusing on their, their part to make something very special at the end of the day. It, what do you think it is about Paw Patrol that has made it such a knockout, knockout success? Yeah, I think first and foremost, the characters. The kids love the characters. Like, Marshall's funny. Like, everybody can relate to one of them, right? Like, I'm Rocky. I'm the mutt in the show, okay? And I wrote myself in. Um, <laughs> and people like Marshall is the fire guy, and some people love Sky, and, and some people like Zuma. So everybody can relate to the pups in, in, a, in a certain way. I think the storytelling is just really healthy, right? It's just about dogs going out and doing rescue missions and doing good things, and they're always playful. Um, uh, so I think it's characters first and foremost. I think the way the show was written, it wasn't written, it was written for preschoolers, but it was written, um, I would say, for advanced preschoolers. It didn't talk down to the kids, right? Um, so the pacing is very different from a traditional preschool show. And so the kids actually, they enjoy that fast pace. They enjoy the excitement. Um, there's also very, there's a, there's the same cadence to every show. Like, so if you guys watch the show, Marshall always runs into the elevator and he always 
you know, smashes into the other pups and they always laugh, right? They're always having a good time, right? They're good time pups doing good things. Um, and you know what, John, the, the parents like the show, right? So that's, that's a good thing. That's key. So it's a, it's, it's a number of factors. Help us understand your strategy and what you were thinking uh, to develop this multi-platform uh, appro approach. Sure. So you go from being a toy company uh, or an object company into a multimedia company. What was, what was your thinking at the time? Well, first, first 26 percent of our industry of the toys that are bought, 26 percent of the toys that are bought in the toy industry come from licensed products. Okay, so it's a huge, huge, huge percentage. And again, at a necessity, um, every time we used to go to the larger uh, content players and we try to get a license, we get turned down. Mm. It would always go to our competitors. So, is that because the the terms of the deal or something else? No, it was it was a result of at the time that our competitors had better international distribution. Um, they thought they had better relationships at retail. They had better, you know, maybe potentially. Uh, you know, development cap capabilities, and they also had relationships. They just had longer, deeper relationships. Um, so we started to develop our own television shows at a necessity to capture some of that 26%. Um, but what ended up happening is that we started capturing the 26%, um, and then on top of that, we started capturing a higher piece of the margin, okay, of the 26%. So not only do we capture the toy margin, but we capture uh, uh, a higher gross margin on the toys because we don't pay as much royalties, and then we capture a whole bunch of margin on the licensing and merchandising, so the t-shirts, the toothpaste, all that part of the business, so we have a totally different revenue stream that comes, comes from uh, the content that we create. So we're not, we've evolved from being a toy company to being um, a kid's entertainment company with multiple revenue streams. And is that something that continues as is, or do you have to keep adding platforms and dimensions to, to what you're doing? Well, I think producing you can expand around creating content. So, for example, you know, Paw Patrol now we're going into season six. You know, we've produced uh, a movie this year. There'll be another movie next year. These are not theatricals. They're actually uh, um, on TV movies and, and direct to DVD. Um, but every year we put out uh, a new season of Paw Patrol. Within the season, there's, there's two themes of 13 episodes each. So we're constantly keeping Paw Patrol fresh. And then we have three other uh, TV shows in production as we speak. We have another show called Abby Hatcher. Um, which is coming out on TVO in January and on Nickelodeon globally around the world in January. Um, and uh, we have Bakugan, which is getting relaunched in Cartoon Network, which is coming out this January. And so there's lots of shows in production, and then now we're going to move into some theatrical stuff into the future. So you're developing all these new things. At the same time, you've also picked up some old lines. You mentioned uh, Meccano, and then you bought this little thing, if anyone the, remembers. The, uh, the etch sketch etch 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 sketch is this just for kind of an optionality play for you, or do you see uh, these old uh, nostalgic products evolving into something new? Well, one of our, you know, we have four growth strategies in our company, and one of the strategies is to um, innovate the brands that we have in the business and also make strategic acquisitions. So this worked really well in our activities portfolio. So we have a large part of our business, which is all about, you know, we have kinetic sand and a whole bunch of activities, and so we saw this as an activity with a really iconic brand with huge high awareness. And so we figured if we can buy a brand um, at a reasonable price and infuse it with our innovation, then we can unlock some potential with uh, future sales. And so that, that, was a, that was a thesis around this. The funniest part about this is that people think this is our biggest seller in the company. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, not. it's the highest brand awareness, but, it's, but people think it's the biggest seller. Let's talk about... Uh... This is great when you're on the airport. Okay, because in the past, you tell people what you do, and they were like, yeah, I kind of remember that toy. This one they all remember. What, what's the best thing you've uh, designed on an Etch a Sketch? You know, John. Um, Some questions you don't want to answer. No, no, I'll work on it for you now. Okay. As as we're talking, it's a challenge. Um, let's talk about uh, a bit about the future challenges that you're uh, that you're thinking about, and and, and one is this uh, little toy, the, the the smartphone. Curious whether the handheld device eventually replaces the handheld toy, and how you think about that. You know, it's a, a it's, challenge. It's a great question. I don't think it's going to happen. I, I thought it, in 2012, 2013, I thought that that would take like 15, 20, 30 percent share of the toy industry. Um, but it hasn't happened to date, and, and I don't think it's going to continue to happen. I, there's something about kids holding physical products in their hands um, and the three-dimensional nature of the physical products. And 
the the tactile nature of it and you know being able to use other senses it's it sounds very traditional but you use a lot of senses when you're playing with toys and and the wish fulfillment and the role play and what you can do with an action figure or what you can do with a doll or the physical act, interaction with an activities or construction with lego so the physicality of it and the wish fulfillment um, are really the the power behind the toys and i think that the the screens are are one dimensional in a sense Kids are also spending, though, a lot more time on this. I think it's now like 50 minutes a day for kids under eight are yep. now on a, a smartphone or a, uh, or a tablet. And in 2011, it was, I think, five minutes a day. Does that change your approach to toys, or do you just kind of set that aside as a, as you know, a concern? The, no, no, it's a great question. The, the most profound thing that those devices have done, okay, is the way that we actually market to kids, okay? There's been an actual, I would call it a revolution in, in marketing to kids. So traditionally, the way we'd market it is we do a television commercial and we put it on YTV or Teletoon or whatever, and, and that would drive the majority of the sales. Now, kids seven, eight, they're not watching TV anymore, and as you guys know, they're watching YouTube, and they're watching YouTube on mobile devices, and they're watching um, influencer videos. So the model has completely changed, and now we've had to reorientate ourselves on how we communicate our products through those devices to kids. Retail channels also changing yes, significantly. Toy, change. toy, Toys R Us goes under this year. How did that affect your business? You know, it's a bit of a headwind. It was a headwind. It was a... Uh, um, so what is it? Walmart, Costco, Target are half your sales? Or? No, I wouldn't. I, no. no we're, I, mean, I mean, over 30 plus percent of our sales are outside of North America. Okay. Right. So the company's quite diverse now. In the last seven or eight years, I mean, we have like 20 offices around the world. And... So we sell, we sell pretty much wherever there is children, we want to sell. Mm -hmm. um, and so that gives us the ability to sell through different retailers. Uh, but Toys R Us was, was unfortunate because, I mean, they were the preeminent toy retailer and they were fun and everybody grew up there and they had this incredible brand. But unfortunately, the, the format didn't lend itself to the way consumers wanted to shop today. And, um, you know, we consider ourselves to be agnostic in terms of who we sell to. And uh, the majority of... And a lot of the retailers, once Toys R Us um, went Chapter 11, they, they went in and they started to take up the sales. And everybody wanted to take up the share. Um, so people started, like Target, they expanded their toy department. Walmart expanded their toy department. You had other retailers doing pop-ups. Even yesterday, I was at, at Whole Foods. They have, I don't know if you guys have seen, but here in Yorkville, they have like a pop-up of selling toys and plush. So everybody's trying to get a little bit of the sales um, to make up for Toys R Us. And, uh, and the industry had to just wait its way through this year. But I think 2019, everything will, will settle. And, uh, Tell us a bit more about Plush. You, uh, you guys bought Gund. Um, I don't know if this is a Gund, but uh, yeah. what took you into that space? Um, you know, again, diversification. So we, we'd never really had a, a Plush part of our business, and uh, there's 11 categories in the toy industry, and this, this happens to be one of them. Uh, it was also an iconic brand. It'd been around for over 100 years. Um, it's the original Plush brand in North America. Um, so to have an amazing brand that you can work and innovate around, um, a category that we've never been in before, and then also uh, a totally different sales distribution channel. So you won't, you won't find this in a Walmart, and you wouldn't even find the gun brand in Toys R Us. So it gave us a lot of diversification from a sales channel perspective. And there's other what we call specialty toys that we had in our business, and they, never used, they were never found their way through to the market because we're really a, you know, a mass market-oriented toy company um, for the toy part of the business. So this gave us a, a distribution channel that we can um, put a lot of the other products through. So those three three parts of the strategy. Amazon. And they're really cute. And they are. They are really yeah, cute. Who wants the who wants the uh, the gun? <laughs> One's going to you. Right. You're welcome. That was the HR person. Nice, oh, that's uh, good, nice, that's uh, good nice, person. Good, good throw. When they, when they when people come into the office, you can you know you can use that as a Amazon, what's that going to do to the uh, to the sector? Amazon's great. It's just it's 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 fantastic. I mean, they're growing their share in toys. Um, they 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 give people like us an opportunity to present our toys to the consumer in a in a in a um, different format. Um, they use videos and the reviews that are fantastic. Um, so it's just it's a it's a great way for people to shop today. So we're we're big fans of Amazon and and happy that they're growing and and uh, um, they're great retailer. Lots more technology coming our ways. I'm thinking of AR and VR, and uh, curious how that might change uh, 
your conversation with those inventors or how you think about your own product lines? You know, I think it, I think it may change the way people shop, potentially, right? Um, I think it goes to the marketing. Uh, so, for example, if people want to put on VR and be able to, to, to almost see a store within a store, or we were talking about like how we do our merchandisers, um, the fact you can build your merchandisers in, in VR and then you can actually present that to the retailers. Um, so I think it's more on the marketing part of things. I, I don't think it will be on the, the toy part. Or maybe I'm just too old school, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll, we'll see, it's exciting. Um, in, in our remaining minutes, I, I, I wonder if you can shed some light on what Canada needs to create more, more spin masters and uh, more excitement, in, in, certainly in the, the toy space. I was shocked when we were talking in your office that you said there were these 150 roughly inventors in uh, Japan, maybe 100 in the US, when I asked how many yep. here. Yeah, not many, not many. <laughs> not many, it's like not zero. Uh, why, why is that? You know, I think it's, it's, it's just a focus thing, right? I mean, I, I, the one thing I would say about Canada and Toronto is like we have the best animators in the world, okay? Canada has the best animators, bar none. They're just incredible. Uh, we lead when it comes to television. We lead when it comes to preschool. We have the best writers. We have the best directors here. We have the best voice talent. Um, and that's a result of the government investing in animation for like the last 50 years and schools like and Sheridan schools, yeah. schools and George Brown and, and all that type of stuff. Um, so I think it's, I just want to point, put that out there that it is, I, I'm immensely proud of the fact that, that, uh, you know, Paw Patrol and Rusty Rivets and Abby Hatcher, it's all done here in Toronto. Um, we pay more money for it, but we find that it's like, it's Dave. Didn't even see there. <laughs> wow. Incredible. I love Dave. <laughs> Dave. Dave is one of the greatest people ever. You guys are very lucky. I've got to tell you, you guys are all very lucky. Um, so, yeah. You stumped the band, band Dave. I'm, I'm, well I'm, done. You know, for my, my next, I really, I, I, I did want a life as a banker. It's like, you guys are like, it's incredible. Like, to be on the other side, loaning the money, it's like incredible. <laughs> it's incredible. But, um, yeah, we're talking about animation. Well, well and, and the and ecosystem in, uh, in Canada or in Toronto specifically. Yes. Yeah, so and then I, I wanted to ask you about what you're doing with the... Yes, so on the toy side of things, we're, we're taking some steps to actually build up an inventor base here in, in Toronto. So um, starting in 2019, we're starting a course. It's going to be a one-year post-education um, course at the Chan School of Continuing Education at Ryerson in collaboration with OCAD. And... If uh, it's basically it's a course to learn how to become a toy inventor, so how to invent toys and then how to actually bring your toys out into the marketplace and get them uh, to the consumers. So we're actually modeling a course that we've had uh, for five years running in a school called Shankar in, in Tel Aviv, and so the results coming out of the school are amazing. Um, and we've actually licensed some products from the students that graduate from that course, and we're modeling that course here at OCAD and um, in Ryerson. So it's very exciting, and then we're going to take it to another uh, city in 2020. We're going to try to get five different schools around the world and get them to all interact together and, and create this whole ecosystem of new, young, fresh uh, toy uh, innovators. That's a great approach. You've got a big company that's, uh, that's on fire. You've got the entrepreneurial inventors and the educators working together. You spent a lot of time in, in Israel. I'm curious what insights you bring back in terms of how they develop an entrepreneurial e ecosystem yep. and what Canada needs to create it's like a hundred more spin masters. You know, I think that, uh, you know, I mean, they're very different to Canada, but they, the thing that they are, that they have going for them is that they like to fail and they're okay with failure. And they actually, they don't celebrate failure, but they're like, it's almost, they wear failure as a, a badge of honor. And it's almost expected that to get a success, you need to fail a handful of times to get the success. And, you know, I've seen it in our business. I mean, we're talking about the successful products up here. I can't tell you how many failures we've had in our business. We just clean them up really fast, and we just don't talk about them a lot. Or I can tell you how many failures we've had in animation. We had three failures before we hit Paw Patrol, okay? Like complete failures. We don't talk about the Redikai, okay, which is a TV product that we created after Bakugan, where, you know, we, I spent two years developing, we spent two years developing the show and the whole toy line, and all the retailers around the world bought in big, and the product, you could not give it away, okay? I, don't, I think there was like a special adhesive glue on the back of the package, okay, that stuck to the shelf. Like you just couldn't, get, like it just couldn't come off the shelf. It was, 
stuck and 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 you know people didn't watch the show it was just like it was just a huge huge failure and I loved it um, so I think that's the thing that they have they're going for them is that it's that they're okay with failing and they expect to fail and they'll keep on trying till they get there right only five percent of the Israel's known for being huge startup nation and success but really only five percent of what they act five percent of the companies that are created every year go on to become a successful company so I think for us here in Canada is that it just has to be a really supportive ecosystem and I think we have we are supportive um, and we continue to be supportive but it maybe it's just a little bit of a mind uh, a mindset shift that we just need to make that it's it's okay to fail um, and you know we need to give young entrepreneurs ways to actually start the business cut the red tape um, uh, uh, easier access to, to the monies um, but I think you know what I think all that stuff's actually happening I think I think it's just a mindset and within Spin Master, how do you guys roll with failure and, and how do you learn from it? The, the truth is we just don't, we don't talk about it that much and we don't, we don't um, apply any blame to one specific person. Okay? Because in what we do and probably with what many people do, um, it's a very much collaborative process and you can't really point to one person. Right? So we'll never point to one person and say, you know, you were the... the the fault behind Radikai, or you were the fault behind Keycard, Key Charm Cuties, or um, so we just we never point to anybody, John, um, and we don't ruminate about it. We just mark down the product, clear it through the retailers, and we're just thinking about the next product and what was and just incorporating the learnings into the design development, the play pattern um, of the next product. So it's and then the flip side is you know we don't attach success either. Like I can't point to the Hatchmo and say that was that one person. Right, that was like 15 people that made that thing really successful, um, and so you need to have it on both parts. You can't just celebrate the success, give one person and and the failure, and so I think that creates a, a really fertile environment for people to really collaborate. And at the end of the day, it's a full collaboration, because people are like even with Paw Patrol, people are like, oh, you, you know, Paw Patrol was yours, and like I can never I could never say that, you know, you know, I was just one piece of, of a larger puzzle. So we, we started with some uh, rapid fire questions, and I wonder if we can wrap up with just some uh, rap, rapid fire responses on innovation insights, if I can call them that, from, from some of your, your, your greatest hits. I'm going to roll through, through these, and I wonder if you just share a line of what, what the great uh, insight is uh, from an innovation point of view, starting with uh, the origin, Earth, Earth Buddy. Uh, unexpected and low cost. <laughs> unexpected, low cost. Uh, air hogs. Wow. Fly it again. Wow. Wow, just having the, the, the just wow. Wow, like I've never seen that before. Um, can't believe it can actually do that. Yeah. Can't believe that a motorcycle can actually just sit there on the stage without tilting over. <laughs> Back again. Uh, wish fulfillment. Paw Patrol. Are we, do we, we want just one word or do you yeah, want? No, just quick, quick ones. Paw Patrol. Storytelling. Yeah. Hachimal. Uh, loud. I'm going. Loud. <laughs> <laughs> Having some noise. You talked a bit about uh, the motorcycle. That's so nice. Do you want to show your baby? Yeah. Which one did you get? Um, I think she's been this one. Really? Come show us. <laughs> you work so hard. <laughs> um, I don't know what, why the colors, the, there's different colors on the eyes. Mm, that's so a good question. Don't know what either. I thought when it, was, it was red that I wasn't loving it enough, or I don't know why it's. Yeah, there, there is. That's true. There's a whole play pattern afterwards. Yeah, it, it was just trying to tell you something. Oh. Sorry, I forgot to give you the instructions. I was, I it? was feeding it. At okay. One point. Nice. <laughs> Which department do you work in? <laughs> On the wealth management side. Wealth management. That's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I want to be friends with you. <laughs> that is unbelievable. <laughs> Well, Maybe I hope you I hope that. Talk about it? <laughs> no, no, no. I think you're doing a great job. <laughs> well, I hope that brings you a lot of wealth and to your clients. <laughs> That's awesome. So this is a, the uh, yes. Uh, the neat thing about this one was that um, it rocked. Oh, there. Mm, it likes me and likes it too. Anyway, thank you. Well done. Thank you. Great. Two more. Gund. There's one behind you. Gund is cuddly. Cuddly. Gund is cuddly. And the classic. That's a sketch. The etch a sketch. Uh, classic, well known, <laughs> incredible brand. What, uh, what an amazing story. It's incredible what, oh, uh, not only what you've built, but what you are uh, building. 
Uh, for our live audience, please stay for a few minutes. We're going to have a special draw. Dave's going to be on stage and draw some names of, uh, for five people who will get to go home with, uh, with uh, some of these uh, toys. And before we go, I want to turn our attention to the screen to share with you something else uh, Ronan is, uh, is known for. Hope we can get it up there. It's not your surfing. It's your photography. Oh. Um, Ronan creates these, uh, these images not only for the uh, artistic and social value of them, but also to help raise money uh, for a cause he's committed to, which is a, called Save a Child's Heart Foundation. And as a token of our appreciation, we're making a donation in Ronan's name to uh, the foundation. I wonder, Ronan, thanks. if you can tell us a bit about the foundation. Uh, well, first of all, thanks to RBC. You guys uh, generously contributed last year. Uh, you contributed again this year. Um, Andrew Fetter, where's Andrew? Andrew, personally came to my office to give me the check. And first of all, I just want to say that at Spin Master, we love you, you guys. Okay, you guys, we didn't even talk about, uh, it's amazing, you, you brushed over it. We didn't even talk about going public and the bank and who was on the lead left and lead right. Does everybody know that RBC was on the lead left? I know it's really important to you guys. <laughs> the lead tables, Andrew's taught me everything. <laughs> Um, but uh, I, I did want to say before we wrap up, before we get to this, I just want to say, you know, we really appreciate the relationship with, with RBC. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, I, I would say this for, for you guys and for all the Canadian banks, it's like, the, it, it is a total partnership and our company would not be where it is um, if not for you guys and the support that you've given us as, as a company and the interest and, and the care. So I, I just want to say thank you very much. Great. Um, and and uh, a little bit about Save a Child's Heart. It's, a, it's an organization that um, uh, uh, is run in Israel, and it's in a hospital called the Wolfson Hospital. And what they do is they uh, do surgeries on children with congenital heart defects. And 95% of the kids um, come from uh, outside of Israel. There are kids mainly from Africa, um, and they can't get the surgeries done in their home countries because they don't have the physicians that know how to do the surgeries. And so what Save a, Child Heart, Save a Child's Heart does is it flies them to Israel. Um, it's about $10,000 per surgery, and they mend the hearts, and then they put them up in what they, it's like a Ronald McDonald house, um, and they stay there for a few weeks to recover with the family, and then they go back to their home countries. Plus, they also take doctors from other parts of the world and they train them in the facility there so that they can eventually do the surgeries in their home countries. And so I had this idea as a lark one year, I, was, I moved into a new house and I had new artwork on the walls. So I was like, oh, I'll just like blow up my photographs that I've been taking over the years. Um, and then I had this idea, I was like, oh, well maybe someone would buy them and I could give the money away for charity. <laughs> and so that's what I did. Um, and so this is some of, the, some of the work you saw there was this year's uh, collection. And I've been doing it for the last five years. And, I invite a lot of people to my house and they come and we serve them some wine and, and cheese and, and then uh, Jody, my assistant, helps me uh, put together the event and, and we, we sell the art and we give it to Save a Child's Heart. I look forward to sharing your, your stunning images with a, with, with a lot more people and uh, supporting you in all, all you're doing, especially to help children. Uh, to our WebEx and Facebook audience, thank you for joining us. Please sign up for our mailing list and uh, you can listen to our podcast on SoundCloud or iTunes. Uh, we also ask you to mark your calendars. January 16th is our next disruptors. We'll be joined by John Chen, the CEO of BlackBerry, who's going to talk about the big pivot uh, and what the world is going to be like uh, for BlackBerry and others in an age of AI cyber security. Lastly, lastly please join me in thanking Ronan for a fantastic conversation. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. That was, uh, that was great fun. Thank you for the toys. And I should have said at the beginning, Spin Master uh, brought their, their, their tree and set it up for us, so uh, thank you for that. And again, please uh, stick around if you can for a special draw, yep. and uh, love to send some toys home with some people. Everyone, have a great day. Thanks for being here. Thanks, John. Good stuff.